Well, I'm, I'm kind of excited to bring this message today, and the reason, I'll give you a little background. God first revealed this, the heart of this message to me uh, coming out of Bible school, because I began uh, putting two and two together from what I had learned and what I was seeing in the Bible, and I'm thinking to myself, gosh, why, why is anybody saying this? And uh, years have passed, and the more years have passed, the more God's been sort of feeding this to me, and yet I really haven't, I mean, I'm sure that I'm not the only one coming to these kinds of conclusions. But if you were to ask me, Dominic, yeah. what, uh, what, is there something that God has given you over the years that, that if you had the, the ability to, to see really propagated out in the body of Christ, that it would be, it would be this. Because I'm just not hearing this, but to me it's like, it's shouting from the pages of this book. So see if you don't agree. And if you do agree, then pray with me that God will, will take this and light a fire with it. So now that I've got your attention, <laughs> tell me, what is this? Okay, that's an American communication satellite. Um, and uh, why did I bring it up? Because we have been seeing something in our lifetime that no one could have ever imagined. You know, cell phones, laptops, emails, texts, social media. All of this has come to be collectively known as what? The digital age. And who was it, should I say what nation, was it that gave the world the digital age? The United States of America. Completely, totally without exception, without qualification. So we're doing a series called America in Prophecy. The title of this sermon is called Enabler of the Enmity. So that's a word, enmity, that means antagonism or, or hatred between two parties. The enabler of the enmity. And of course, I'm speaking of something specifically biblical which hopefully you'll know about by the time I'm done. So let's review my primary analogy for this series. Shall we do that? The analogy of the, the bowling pins? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that I count 10 props on the stage, 10 things that have to be in place just before the second coming of Jesus Christ as predicted in the Bible. And it so happens that every single one of those 10 things were enabled, were set in place by one nation. And that nation is the United States of America. The United States is not specifically named in the Bible, and yet it has that role. You look at all those props, you look at all those things that have to be in place, and it's only the United States that put them there. So I've used the analogy of the bowling pins and the pin setter that comes down, sets everything in place, and then disappears. The United States is God's pin setter. But who is the United States? You and I. So this has direct application to all of our lives, as I hope you will especially see today. So here's the premise. We should all have prophetic patriotism in our hearts. And by that I mean a desire to preserve America so that American America can fulfill its prophetic purpose until the second coming of Christ. Let me repeat that. We should all have prophetic patriotism in our hearts. Prophetic patriotism, which is a desire to preserve America so that... Now, not any other reason. Because what did Jesus say about heaven and earth? It's going to pass away. This is the, to me, this is the only reason to have the, what I would call patriotism, but I'm going to say prophetic patriotism. Why, why preserve something that the Bible says eventually it's all just going to be gone? Well, here's the reason. So that America can preserve its prophetic purpose that God created us for until the second coming of Christ. So what are the pins that we've covered so far in our series? Well, first of all, we've covered... Uh, the fact that, uh, first of all, there had to be a safe haven for the Jewish people after 70 AD when the Romans came and dispersed the Jewish people, which is called the Diaspora, because they were being hunted down and persecuting, persecuted 
everywhere in the world except one place. What's that place? The United States of America. Number two, there had to be a defender and protector of Israel reborn. So Jesus had said, with a tear in his eye, this people is going to be scattered, led captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Then Jerusalem is not going to be Gentile anymore. Gentile is just a word that means not Jewish. It's going to be Jewish again. Well, when that happened in 1948, there had to be a nation that wouldn't be mad about it. There was only one. What was that nation? The United States of America. And I believe by God's sovereign timing, the only nation at that time with the atomic bomb. So when we said, nope, that's Israel again, there wasn't anything anybody could do about it. That's God. Okay. Number three was, there had to be a nation that was the reuniter of Rome reborn. That God predicts in the Bible that Rome, the Roman Empire, would come back again. And there had to be a democratizer of Rome reborn because it had to be a certain way that nations of a different culture, different language, could figure out how to act as one entity. And that then becomes a template for the whole world coming under one ent entity. And the reason why it had to be Rome, remember we talked about cosmic payback? Had to be Rome. Why? Because Jesus died at the hands of Rome, and now Rome's going to die at the hands of Christ when he comes back. That is a biblical concept. It's called reciprocity throughout the Bible. Actually has something to do also with what we're going to talk about today. Reciprocity. It's everywhere. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Uh, with the measure that you meet, it shall be meted back to you again. Given, it shall be given unto you, right? All, it's, it's throughout. Rome has to be reconstituted again because Christ died at the hands of Rome. Now Rome will die in the end at the hands of Christ when he comes back. Okay. Today, we're going to look at two more. America was also destined to be the catalyst for a future Antichrist and catalyst for a future Eve. Now I know I've got a lot of wide eyes. What in the world? Aha. That's what we're going to talk about. So does everybody know what a catalyst is? So you can, you can be in chemistry class, you know, and have two compounds, and they're stable together. And then you add another, you introduce another compound called a catalyst. And it totally changes the nature of that otherwise stable compound. It's like the, it's like the classic uh, you know, kid with his science fair project. He, he has a big beaker, right? And he builds a, a, a volcano around it. The idea being that now he's going to add that drop of something or other, and it's going to go, it's going to erupt. Okay? Well, America is the catalyst of history. Because here is the world going along, and suddenly you've got this nation, which is the engine of modernity. Does everybody know what I mean when I say modernity? Modern life. Everything. This, we're near Detroit, aren't we? I mean, the light bulb, the automobile, the airplane, and of course, the internet. America becomes the catalyst for modern life. Nothing in end times prophecy can happen. Nothing. Without the United States, the catalyst, being an engine for modern life. It's as if God came to the point where he said, you know what? Just like he said to Judas at the Last Supper, Jesus, what you must do, let's just do this quickly. When it came time in history, God said, you know what? Let's wrap this thing up. Let's get this over with. Let there be America. That's the idea. Okay. So I think I need to first explain the whole point of prophecy in the Bible. So God didn't save mankind in some random way, right? He chose, when mankind decided to be his own God and make his own rules and, and he became fallen, quote unquote, then God chose Abraham to be the father of faith. Abraham had Isaac and Jacob, two sons. That Jacob had 12 tribes, sons, tribes. He decided to form the nation of Israel so we could have a Bible, so we could have a Messiah, so we'd know the difference between right and wrong, the law, so we'd understand who he is and what he's like, and how he feels about things. That's how he did it. 
But what he did too, which was very, very interesting, is that he said to Moses, when Moses had delivered them out of Egypt, and so Moses' brother and sister were, were getting mad at him. You know how it is with families. No fight like a family fight. God says, all right, come here. He calls, he calls Moses, Aaron, his brother, and Miriam. Aaron and Miriam were fighting with Moses. And he, he opens our eyes. God opens our eyes. He says to Aaron and Miriam, look, when I send a prophet. Now, God had not yet sent any prophets. I'm going to do it one way. But when I send the law, when I give you right and wrong, when I give you the Ten Commandments, or when, I, when Jesus is going to come, you know, he doesn't say it at that point, what you're going to have to know that's clear is going to be clear. Look, listen to what God says to Moses, to Miriam. Well, he's speaking to Miriam and Aaron, really. This is Numbers chapter 12. This is God speaking. Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, remember, he had not sent prophets yet, but he's giving you, he's giving you, he's, this is, he's saying, this is how it's going to be. I'm going to send prophets. He says, when there's prophet, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision or speak with him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I shall speak mouth to mouth, even openly, not in riddles. So God is telling you up front, I'm going to send prophets. They're going to predict the future. And in their lifetime, when they're walking around their house and doing stuff and walking down the street, they're going to predict the future. And 100% has to be accurate if they're really a prophet, 100%. But I'm going to give them stuff to write down, and it's going to seem like a riddle. But that's, that's on purpose. Why? Because in my wisdom, if I told you the future exactly it shall be, it will destroy you. You will lose your minds trying to fit into that. So he tells the future in such a way, in a riddle, so that when it happens, you know, oh my gosh, that, that was God. He knew all along. A famous example, we don't have time to go there, is when he says to Zechariah, you know, how much am I worth? And God's, in the, you know, uh, bring out for me the price of a slave, 30 pieces. See, Zechariah says, so I took 30 pieces of silver and I cast it into the temple for the potter. And that's a riddle because they had no idea what that meant. Jesus Christ was betrayed by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. The Pharisees said, this is blood money when Judas tried to return it. They threw it in the temple. Well, actually, Judas did. They said, you know what? We're going to take this money and give it and, and buy a potter's field. So when it happens, you think, there is no way that that wasn't God. There's no way. But when he spoke it, it was a riddle. Now, I need to explain another principle found in the Bible. It's called the principle of first mention. Anybody ever heard the principle of first mention? You have. Very good, Sherry. So you know I'm not making this up. Well, here's the idea. Whenever you have a series of things happening in the Bible, you always want to look at the very first time it's mentioned because it's going to carry some extra weight. It's going to have extra significance. For example, the lamb, the blood of the lamb being the first sacrifice then introduces the sacrificial system. There's extra weight on the Passover. Or the, the law of God, the Ten Commandments, that's when it's introduced, that has extra weight. Or Jesus, when he told the parables, remember what he said? He told his first parable of the sower, parable of the sower. And then they said, Lord, what does this mean? And what Jesus said, you mean you don't know what this means? If you don't understand this parable... That's what he said. How then will you understand all the parables? So that is the principle of first mention. So God has he's told us, right, in his word, that he's going to have prophets and prophecy. When does God give the first prophecy? I think in the Garden of Eden. Okay, so what happened was <clears throat> Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And then God speaks to Adam, Eve, and the serpent. We know the serpent is Satan because later on in the Bible, it specifically says that was Satan. So he speaks. And first he says, Satan, you know, you're, you're going to be cursed more than cattle. The idea is that you're going to be bound. Cattle were about to be domesticated. Who can bind Satan now? That's a prophecy. Who can bind Satan? You and me. Jesus says, behold, I give you power 
to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. And whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So Satan, you're cursed more than cattle. You're going to be bound. And you're going to eat dust. Dust is the symbol of death, the death of man. God said to Adam, you know what? Because you've done this, you're going to die. Remember that you are dust. Unto dust you shall return. Death. Satan, you're going you're gonna to be you're going to be breathing the death of man. The whole just from in hell, you're going to be with the death of man for eternity. And then he gives his first prophecy about human history. Remember what I said? Principle of first mention. This should have extra weight. Watch. This is starting to read at Genesis three, chapter fifteen. He's speaking to Satan and to Eve. I, God, will put enmity, hatred, antagonism between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Now, because it's so important, at least I'm making that case, we need to pause and break that down bit by bit and try to get wisdom from God of what it means. Because he told us, it's a riddle. That's what he said. So here's breaking it down. I will put enmity between you, right? And the woman. So you is Satan. The woman is Eve. And between your seed, we don't know what that means at this point in the narrative. And between your seed... And her seed. Okay, we know that eventually, through the Virgin Mary, that's Jesus Christ. Notice how this is, you see how it's a riddle, like God promised? Then he, which is Eve's seed, Jesus, right? Will bruise your head, which can only happen to a snake if done by stomping on the head with the heel. So in the ancient world, they knew what that meant. And when you stomp on a, the head of a snake, you have to do it unexpectedly, which is why I believe it says that if, if the principalities had known the plan of the cross conquering them, they would have never crucified the Lord, Lord of glory because you sneak up on a snake and you stomp his head with your heel. That's what you do. So he, Jesus, will bruise your head which can only be done by stomping on a snake. And then the next piece is you, Satan, will bruise his heel. So when you stomp on the head of a snake with a bare foot, what are you going to get coming back into your foot? You're going to get fed the fangs because the fangs are kept, they're curled up into the, to the head. You're going to get pierced, literally pierced, right? He will, and he will, you'll bruise... Heel is the place where the, where the divine Jesus touches the earth, the cross, the blood of the cross. So you're, yes, Satan, you're going to bruise his heel. So, so we can solve the riddle of who the eventual seed or offspring, seed means offspring of the woman is going to be, but who is this seed or offspring of the serpent? Who is the offspring of the serpent? I'm re raising that question rhetorically. The Bible eventually tells us who that person is. Here's the idea. When mankind says, yes, Satan, we agreed. Satan said, if you disobey God, then you will be like God. You will be God. Man will be equivalent of God. So in the biblical reckoning of things, man has to have what he said he wanted to have sooner or later. There has to be a point at which the world is ruled by somebody who claims to be God. And that was set in motion from day one. So let's go to the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus begins to take the veil away for us to understand that. So keep in mind that Jesus' disciples knew that Jesus was talking about another riddle. From prophecy. Because these were nice Jewish boys. They'd been to synagogue. And they were taught the prophecies by the Pharisees. 
Why did the prophets, why did the Pharisees who were in charge of the Jewish people, why were they so diligent to always teach the prophecies about the Messiah over and over and over again so that even the fishermen knew about them? Why do you think? Because they're trying to keep morale up. They're under oppression of Rome. That's the only place where hope comes from. And so they would teach them about Daniel 7. They'd teach them about Daniel 9 and Isaiah 9 and all of it. So when Jesus is giving this description, the disciples know what he's talking about. He's talking about another riddle from Daniel. Let's read Matthew 24. When you see the abomination of desolation, which means the sin that brings destruction, I mean mass destruction, through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place in the temple... Let the reader understand. So we know that Matthew's gospel was written initially to the Jewish people. So he's saying, you Jewish people will understand. That's what he's saying. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in the house. Whoever is in the field must not go back to get his cloak. Woe to those who are pregnant, those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray your flight be not in winter or on the Sabbath. Again, I mentioned that. He's predicting that there will be a, a government in charge of very, very orthodox Jews where it's illegal to travel on the Sabbath. It's another prediction snuck in there. Jesus continues, For there will come a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will again. Unless those days were cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, for the sake of the Jewish people, with promises yet unfulfilled, for the sake of the promises made to national Israel, that still have to happen. Those days will be cut short. So Jesus has just told us this. He's just taken a bunch of that veil off of the riddle. He told them that that person in Daniel would not just be anybody. <laughs> He's going to be the one who will literally fulfill the false promise that Satan made to Adam and Eve in the garden that man could one day be God. And he will commit that sin, a sin so terrible that it would result in almost all life on earth coming to an end. Because then the hand of God completely lifts off of earth. Because now it's owned by Satan. It's run by Satan. It's controlled. Okay, you want that? Go for it. And mankind will almost destroy himself and everything alive on this planet. And that's what you get when you want to be your own God. And that has to happen. Jesus said these things must happen. He said, don't be upset. Don't be afraid. These things must happen. In the biblical reckoning of things, you reap, come on, what you sow. And if not for the fact that God says, you know what? I do have some loose ends to tie up. I made certain promises to my friend Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That they're going to be in charge one day and there'll be peace in this world. So... Just before, it's all going to end. We don't even know how. Jesus Christ will return. And all the tribes of the earth will see that. Jesus said, all the tribes of the earth will see the sign, a vision of the Son of Man, speaking of himself, coming. And they will mourn like, like you lost your, your firstborn. Because they'll know it's him. And I believe what he'll do is they'll see a vision of this. Why? Because it says, they shall look upon me, speaking of the Jewish people whom they have pierced. Right? The two fangs of the serpent when he's crushing his head. Right there. So this is how the Apostle Paul describes that person. This is the seed, the offspring of the snake. This answers the question. Let's go there. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 12. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Christians. And by extension, he's speaking to all of us. Let not one of you be deceived in any way for the day of the Lord. That's the day when in the Old Testament, when God comes back to take charge of the planet Earth. The day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first, falling away. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. Anomia, no law, a law unto himself. He is the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat 
in the temple of God in Jerusalem, displaying himself as being God. There it is, folks. Do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only that he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. This is he whose coming will be in accord with the activity of Satan, with power, signs, and false wonders, and the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they will not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a delusion, deluding influence, so that they will believe what is false in order that they may be judged who do not believe the truth, but instead look, take pleasure in wickedness. What is the delusion of the coming Antichrist? Simply this. The delusion of the Antichrist will be to convince everyone that a one-world global money system is the way to at last have peace on earth. Because we all need money, don't we? And all the nations are in terrible debt. The United States is in debt. Everyone is. Well, when the time is right, what's he going to say? He's going to say, hey, everybody. Why just keep pushing a chain like this? Let's start over. Just cancel it all and start over. All of us, together. One system. But what's he going to need? That was impossible until what? Don't answer that question yet. Here's the prophecy given to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation that describes how he's going to do this. This is Revelation 13, 16. And he causes all, small and great, rich and poor, free men and slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast, that's the Antichrist, or the number of his name. That was impossible until the digital age, until the communication satellites. Your entire banking system is joined at the hip with a satellite orbiting in geosynchronous orbit right now. Everything, your phone, your internet, your buy ability to buy and sell online, your banking, everything. But will everyone be deceived by the Antichrist? Are there any signs of meaningful resistance? I believe the Bible says there are signs that there will be meaningful resistance against the Antichrist. Here's another, another riddle for you. This is a prophecy in the book of Daniel. This, what I'm about to read to you, has been a riddle for many generations. We talked about this in Bible school. So my mentor in Bible school was on the translating team of the New American Standard Bible. And the reason they decided there should be a New American Standard Bible is because those, I believe it's called the Lachman Foundation, they decided there needs to be a literal translation in English, like so that it's as literal as possible. So I'm going to read to you from the New American Standard Bible. This is the prophecy of Daniel, chapter 11. And he's speaking, God is speaking to Daniel about the Jewish people. Some who will have insight will fall in order to be refined, purge and make them pure until the time of the end. So even to Daniel, God is speaking to Daniel about, here's Jewish history, here's, and then there's this thing called the time of the end. Because it is still to come at the appointed time. At that time, what time? The time of the end, 
The king, the guy who's in charge, will do whatever he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will speak monstrous things against the god of gods, who is the Jewish god, Yahweh, Jehovah. He will prosper until the indignation, the indignation, is finished. When you hear the transgression, the indignation, it means the whole sin deal, the fall in Eden, the whole mess is finished. For that which is decreed, what does decreed mean? Jesus said, these things must, must happen. This has to happen. That which is decreed will be done. Here's a description of this guy. He, this king who's going to be in charge, this antichrist who will lift himself above all gods, he will show no regard for the God of his fathers. So that's a plural Elohim. Some of your translations may say gods, but it means the God of his fathers. Or for the desire of women. We're going to get back to that. Nor will he show regard for any other God, for he will magnify himself above all. So the great riddle of this has been that phrase, desire of women. And that is the literal meaning. Some of your translations will say, well, the God that women desire which I agree with my mentor saying, you know, first of all, that's not what it literally says. Second of all, it, that doesn't make sense. But the reason they, they put that in there is so, so the, you know, the gods of his fathers, the god women desire, and, and any other god, they're trying to make it uniform. But that's not what it says. And so it's been a riddle for many generations. What in the world does that mean? Now, I've said in the past that some believe that means, well, he's just saying that the that the Antichrist will not be heterosexual. But the more I study it, that can't be true. Do you know why? Because that would be a deal breaker for way too big a percentage of the world population. See, they're supposed to follow him, all nations and tongues. And, and the, the cultures of, of Islam, of China, of the Indian subcontinent, which is like, now you're talking about the majority of human beings on earth. They would never, ever follow to this degree, to this degree of loyalty, anyone who was not heterosexual. So I, I agree with those that say, no, that cannot be what it means. I believe that it tells us how the fulfillment of the prophecy of the enmity regarding Eve will take place. Because if this doesn't do it, there's no other place in scripture that does. If I'm, if I'm wrong, and again, I'm not the only one saying this. If I'm wrong about how, what I'm saying, I'm about to say to you, or what this means, then the first, you remember the principle of first mention? The first thing God says out of his mouth about there being this hatred, this, this antagonism, is never... Fulfill. Oh, the thing about the crushing of the head, the thing about the bruising, all that, all that happens, right? We know. But here's one. Let's break that down. Here is the description to Daniel of the Antichrist in its three pieces. Number one, he will show no regard for the God of his fathers. I believe it means he won't adhere to Christianity. Because we know he's coming out of Europe, and Europe is nominally Christian. Number two, or for the desire of women. If you look at the word desire, it has to do with preciousness or value. It means he won't have any value for women. He'll hate women. Enmity. He will hate women. Unfortunately, whereas not being heterosexual would be a deal breaker, unfortunately, this would not be. Isn't that terrible? Yeah, this guy doesn't like women. We don't care. One world money is a great idea. That's sad, isn't it? Number three, nor will he re have regard for any other god, religion, for he will magnify himself above them all. In other words, he will be ecumenical. No, you know, you can believe whatever you believe as long as you believe in me. So those are three things. He won't adhere to the Christianity of his ancestors. He will hate women. And he'll be an ecumenical one world religion guy. To put it simply, I believe the prediction between Satan and the woman, 
right? I will put enmity, hatred, between you and the woman. It's pointing to a future Eve, a future generation of women that will be a thorn in the side of the Antichrist, the seed of the serpent. And he'll hate them for it. Why? Because biblical reciprocity demands it. Satan got the best of Eve in the garden in the beginning. Eve will get the best of Satan in the end. And it was all about deception. Remember that? And, and by the way, that also explains why there are certain parts, I believe, that the book of Esther is a prefiguring, a prediction about Eve's revenge. I believe it's not an accident that the first person Jesus revealed himself to as the Messiah, that she's not the seed, everybody else was, is the woman at the well. The first person to preach the gospel is the woman at the well. The first person that he appears to after he raised from the dead is Mary Magdalene. These are all prefigurings pointing to what I'm talking about. Now, some of you might say, well, what about Mary, the Virgin Mary? Wasn't she fulfillment? Yes, but there's no mention of enmity specifically between Mary and Satan. So that can't be the fulfillment of that enmity. She's more the fulfillment of the seed that crushes the head. So then we ask the question, okay, Dominic, let's say, let's say you're right. Let's say that the description to Daniel about this is what the Antichrist will look like. He won't be a Christian. He'll hate women. And he'll be an ecumenical guy. What if that's true? Why? Why is he going to hate women? <laughs> well, I believe the Bible tells us that also. And so before I introduce that, I, was gonna, I asked Olivia to please come up here and, and share a couple things with us. Olivia, can you come up and speak into that mic? Maybe lower it a little bit if you need to. Hi, thank you. <laughs> so I have basically two questions for you that helps me to lead into where I'm going with this. Number one, can you um, maybe give some insight into how uh, God is using social media um, in our time, especially with, by the way, if you go to Google and you Google Instagram, you say, how many are women? So 70% of users of Instagram are women, by the way. Social media. That's just as an aside. And 70% of American teenagers are on Instagram, by the way. So anyway, can you share with us a little bit? Yeah, of in so Instagram is a very powerful tool, and it can be good, used for good or bad. And in this case, spreading the gospel is obviously good. So I'm just going to share a story. So on TikTok, by the way, TikTok is the most successful social media app of this year. It's bigger than Instagram and about to pass Facebook. So about like last fall, I felt like the Holy Spirit was leading me to do a photography of the fall trees. And so I did that and then, and then I put the gospel through that. So I made a little video edit of that. And I didn't think anything of it. I was like, the world's gonna hate this because it's obviously the gospel. So over time, it got over 200,000 views. And, and you shared the gospel? Yes. And people always say, like, oh, sharing the gospel is so hard. No, it's very, very easy. It's very easy through social media. So over time throughout the winter, I saw, like, a rise of young Christian influencers about my age or younger making Christian content. And they were going after all religions. And, by the way, I posted this video on TikTok. And right now, there's a literal revival going around on TikTok. Like, I have, like, I made amazing friends that are also Christian influencers. And this one guy preached the gospel to, like, millions of people. And that's because the algorithm is better on TikTok. And now we're planning to go through other social media apps if TikTok gets banned. Okay, second question. So you were explaining to me about how sometimes social media is against Christians and that they'll ban certain things. Like a video will go on, it'll be on, and then they'll ban it. They'll take it off. And yet that video will still get really wide viewership. Can you, be, and can you 
explain how that can happen? Yeah, so obviously the media is not our friend. Like, it is being ran literally by very evil people. Just because you have a freedom of speech and you can post something does not mean many people will see it, if that makes sense. So there's been Christian videos on YouTube exposing the One World Order that's going on right now and the agenda. Well, YouTube is actively banning these videos. I don't know if you knew that. So this one person like s recorded the video and set up like a pri made it private and said about password. And she said, "Type this in," and it already got like 20 million views. Okay. So what she was explaining to me is that as long as you're going to have an internet, theoretically, there's no way to stop the propagation of a video. For example, if you if you're the enemy and you see something on social media and you ban it. Well, somebody else has seen it, and they recorded it, and they make for themselves a private account. And they say, okay, now I've got it. So now that means that supposedly only whoever I invite can see it. So then I give to, let's say, Olivia, my account, say, you can see this. Well, she's going to record it too, and she's going to do the same thing. And then she'll tell two friends, and she'll tell two friends, and then just goes, so it went, was 20 million, you said, right? Yeah. And so the only way to stop that is shut down the whole internet. But what's the Antichrist Christ problem going to be? He's got a one world order, one world money that is going to be entirely dependent on those communication satellites. He can't shut down the internet. He can't stop this. And so he's going to hate. Why would he hate women? I just told you. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the generation of Eve's revenge. Thank you. Sit down. So to nail down what I'm saying, let's go to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Now, this has also been a riddle for generations, generations, which now is not a riddle anymore, I believe. This is what God showed to the apostle John. And this is John speaking. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. It literally means in mid heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And another angel followed. Now, I'm paraphrasing a little bit because we don't have time to read that whole section. Another angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, receive his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he shall drink the wine of the wrath of God. So listen up. I agree with those who say that since another meaning for this word, I saw another angel, angelos, is messenger. In Greek, those, are the, those two words are the same. Angelos means messenger. Messenger means angelos. John is saying, I saw another messenger flying in mid heaven and that the angels were not given the great commission. That's why it's been a riddle. The angels aren't supposed to do this. We get the great commission. <laughs> so suddenly in Revelation, now God's going to tell. And not only that, it says, I saw an angel flying in mid heaven, giving the gospel to every nation? Well, how is an angel going to do that? I believe that God was showing him a communication satellite, a messenger in Manhattan, preaching the gospel, literally, not only preaching to every nation, but what did we also read? Saying, this guy is the Antichrist. Do not follow him. And there will be nothing that the Antichrist, who hates women, is going to be able to do about it unless he takes all the satellites out of the sky and shuts down his very lifeblood for control, which is the whole banking, the whole she shebang. There's the, it's a no-win situation for him. And the gospel, oh, they'll, they'll play whack-a-mole like the Chinese are trying to do. You know the game whack-a-mole? The mole, you whack it, it goes down. Here's another mole, you whack it. But as long as you have the ability for two people to individually communicate with one another, you can have this, this sort of viral, if I want to call it that, expansion of, and you cannot stop it unless you shut down the whole thing, which you can't do. So his strength will also be his weakness. Final thought. After the book of Revelation, John comes back to Ephesus and he writes some letters to the churches and by extension to you and I. This is what he says. Children. This is the apostle John speaking to Christians. It is the last hour. And just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming. 
Even now, many antichrists have appeared. From this, we know that it is the last time, the last hour. They went out from us, they, but they were not really for us, with us, of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And you all know. Gnosko, know by experience. You have, hear that ladies? You have an anointing from the Holy One. A prophecy promised back in the Garden of Eden. It is your birthright as a born-again Christian woman, to carry out the biblical reciprocity wherein Saint Satan finally gets what he's going to get. Reciprocity. Satan got the best of Eve in the beginning. Eve is going to get the best of Satan in the end. And I believe with all my heart, that, what we just talked about, and the prophecy in John about the angel in mid-heaven to all the nations and so on, and how can that be because angels aren't supposed to preach the gospel? I just told you about it. I just explained it to you. That's a riddle that could not have been solved until now. That's why I believe prophetic patriotism for an American woman should include Embracing the anointing against Satan that God promised Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now, we're hoping, ladies, that you won't be here when the real hell really breaks loose. But what did John say? He said, well, you know, the spirit of Antichrist is here right now. So you can get to work right now. So I'm going to read it again. I believe prophetic patriotism for an American woman should include embracing the anointing against Satan that God promised Eve in the Garden of Eden. And that's why prophetic patriotism for an American Christian man, boy, I hope you guys are listening, should include encouraging Christian women to be all that they can be for Jesus and his kingdom. You want to impact the kingdom of God? You encourage the women in your life to be all they can be. Why? Because there's a prophetic promise already upon them. That you can help to fulfill. So if you're here today and you're listening, you know, let's speak, speak to the women first and then we'll speak to the men. Ladies, you know, some of, some of, you know, I've been a pastor long enough to know that many of you ladies, you think you, you, you hate yourself. Uh, you, you don't know why you're here. You, you don't feel, you don't feel pretty. You don't feel worthy. You don't feel, you, you, you know, who knows what happened to you. you your father, some of you don't never knew your father some of you had fathers who did terrible we there's it, it, we live in a broken world well i have some good news for you jesus christ died for your sins jesus christ is the son of god and god the son the bible says god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son jesus so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life so the blood jesus shed on the cross the two viper fangs in his blessed hands that's for you and if you believe that he died to take the rap for you the punishment you deserve that we all deserve on the day of judgment he took that away he took it for you past present and future sins forgiven if you believe that and if you believe he rose from the grave on the third day so that you would never have to fear death anymore you believe that and you're saved not just saved from judgment not just saved so you can live forever ever with Jesus, but saved so you can do this. You can be a part of, of something so powerful, so much anointing, so much at the heart, so close to the heart of God that we can't begin to fathom it because God loves payback. 
You have an anointing on you of discernment, of to not be deceived, to have zeal for the gospel, to think and get wisdom from God. And how are we going to get through? How are we going to get through? God wants to give you that. So if, you're, if, you, if you want purpose, if you want to know what your purpose is, just pray this prayer with me. We'll start with the ladies. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe. You are the son of God. You are the seed that would crush the head of the serpent. And you did that for me. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Live your life in me. And I will live for you and serve you all the days of my life. If you're a Christian man out there and you have a little bit of that antichrist in you where you have a problem with women, where, where you're just a little bit thinking that, you know what? You don't, there's things you don't like. I want to encourage you to change your mind. That's what the word repent means. Change your mind. Because God has raised you up not just to also be a messenger of the gospel, but to encourage the generation who will be Eve's revenge. And these women, all the women, my daughter, my wife, my other daughters, they need us to encourage them because that's the way God does things. And so you pray this too. Maybe that's your purpose. If you don't know Jesus Christ, it's time to join his army. Just say, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I believe in you. Do you die for my sins and rose on the third day? I don't want to be afraid anymore. I don't want to feel inadequate in my manhood because I know if I encourage the daughters of Eve, then to God, I am a man. So come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Live your life in me. And I will live for you and serve you all the days of my life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.